You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee, and with me, Paul Doroshenko, my sometimes co-host. Struggling along. Struggling along. This week. Why are you struggling, Paul? Saturday at 515, driving home, Southwest Marine Drive, I was rear-ended by a driver, a new driver without an N, in a Porsche Panamera. What? A new driver in a Porsche? In a white Porsche Panamera in Vancouver. Gee, what a shock. Wow. What happened? I was launched. It Mm -hmm. was completely, I had no idea this car was coming up behind me. I was driving at a slow speed because it was heavy traffic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was launched and uh, I am injured. Were you launched into anything? I was launched into a Tesla. So, So, okay. And sorry, were you driving your green truck? What were you driving? I was driving a uh, 15-year-old sedan. Oh, come on. Well, it's a Mercedes, but it's a, still it's a 15-year-old no, sedan. I just want you to be my ridiculous driver of the week. Not you, but your accident. We're starting off with the ridiculousness. So it's Vancouver. The most Vancouver know, accident on the ever. South, on Southwest Marine Drive, <laughs> where the houses are ridiculously expensive and most of them vacant. Mm-hmm. Um, and the driver who struck me had multiple addresses on the documents. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and an N. And, and, and a Porsche. And an N, but no N, and all the all the little stuffed toys in the back window. I wish that... And the speed wing out on the Porsche. When I had my N, I could have had a Porsche. I don't think you would want one. Uh, it's clear that um, it's too much for some people, and that was the sense I got with the driver who struck me. Mm-hmm. And struck you, pushing you into a Tesla. Pushing me hard. It was a real blow. Like it was beyond anything I ever want to experience. I've I've been rear-ended before. I've been in a couple of accidents uh, that weren't my fault where I was struck. Um, this was much worse. So you're going to call our good friend Eric McGracken, friend of the podcast, challenge the injury caps that you're going to be subject to? You know, I thought about calling Eric, and the uh, thing about Eric is he's my friend, mm. and uh, I love Eric, and he's a great guy. He's probably, you know, I think he's the top of the uh, ICBC injury lawyers, at least, you know, following the the world of ICBC injury law. He's certainly the most prominent, and I know some of the settlements he's got have been pretty freakishly good. Yeah. Uh, but um, right now I'm dealing with Chris Carta, uh, who's also a very good guy, and... Um, also a friend of the podcast. A friend of the podcast, but a little bit further away from me in that. I know he keeps declining of... my invitations to come on the podcast. So I, I'm maybe he's not a friend of the podcast. Who knows? I mean, maybe I won't need a lawyer. <laughs> uh, of course, I will be represented. Well, I thought maybe we wouldn't be recording together this week, and I was a, a little bit panicking. Well, I have to keep my eyes closed as we're doing this, because I have to tell you, it's hard for me uh, right now in the day, and uh, it's hard for me to focus on you over there. Well, that's usually hard for you to focus on me, <laughs> let's be honest. Ha, ha, ha. Um, okay. Uh, well, I just came from recording another podcast, well, so like I've gone a, podcast yeah. to podcast. You're like a podcast star. You were on... You know. <laughs> I was talking about this with Mo Amir from the This Is Van Color podcast. He said, you're a podcast star. And I said, more like a podcast whore. You have a podcast? I'll be on it. <laughs> well, I mean, if it's something that's interesting that you're into, that you want to talk about, you're not going to be on just any old podcast. I'll go on whatever podcast. Why Will not? you? Yeah, oh, why okay. not? If I have the time. So I finally got to meet Mo on Saturday. That was great. Before yes. my accident. And now, you know, I was hit so hard that my, my memory lost. I don't even remember. No, he's a lovely guy. He's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I was on the uh, Fear of Science podcast hosted by Jeff Porter and Daniel Chai. Uh, Jeff Porter works at Science World. It's an unofficial Science World podcast. Uh-huh. And that Science World supports it, but it isn't Science World's podcast. And we talked about fear of driving and got into some social science about driving as well as some actual science about driving. So that was kind of fun. Well, I have some real fear of driving right now after my accident. Um, I've been um, 
scared to get back behind the wheel. It's hard for me to drive because I'm stiff and it's hard for me to shoulder check and it's hard, you know, I know my mm -hmm. reaction time is not as good as it was before the accident. Um, the, um, and I, I feel that much more frail. Uh, and I think my body couldn't take something else. Uh, of course I've gone like 17 was the last time I had an actual accident that was serious mm -hmm. enough that I, you know, could have sustained an injury like I did this time. And uh, it was probably your fault when you were 17. Uh, well, they faulted at 50, 50. We had two yield signs, um, that were to the right of each other. And I, it kind of looked like I had the right of way. And so they were never sure it was just a weird intersection in Edmonton. Right. But, um, the, um, I was, I was moving along pretty fast. Yeah. You were 17. Exactly. Driving but, like a 17 year old. <clears throat> exactly. And my Datsun. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, but no, I've been really quite frightened about driving. Um, apprehensive about driving and worried about, uh, you know, making those left-hand turns or making those right-hand turns and whether or not I'm timing things and a little bit scared. Fair enough. Driving at 52 kilometers an hour or 50 kilometers an hour in the 50 zone and Jesus feels so fast right now because I feel Meanwhile, frail. everyone behind you is like, what the I fuck know, is this wrong Vancouver, with this guy? Guys, you should be driving at least 60. Come on, grandpa. Well, that's normal in the school zone when I'm driving 30. Yeah. Uh, but the, um, yeah, and it just feels fast. All right. So ridiculous driving of the week or ridiculous driver of the week would be Paul Doroshenko's most Vancouver accident ever, Porsche into Mercedes into Tesla. On Southwest Marine Drive. On Southwest Marine Drive. Well, the, the uh, Porsche driver was apparently likely on her phone from what I could tell. And so. had an N. Yeah. Now, moving on to other... Well, she rear-ended a lawyer, too. Yeah, yeah. So. It's all so Vancouver. Um, moving on to other more interesting driving law topics. Legislation uh, passed in British Columbia uh, recently that allows... Uh, it was passed on Wednesday this week, so Wednesday, November 26th. Um, 26th? Sounds about right. Yesterday was 27th. the 27th. Today's yeah. the 28th. Today, yeah. So the 27th, November 27th, um, BC uh, <clears throat> passed legislation that requires oil companies to reveal how it sets gas prices. And this, of course, was a response to the BC Utilities Commission, um, which found that uh, essentially there was a 13 cent completely unexplained and arbitrary difference between what we pay for gas here in the lower mainland and what everybody else in the Pacific Northwest pays for gas. Well, and then they conducted that inquiry and they got basically no help from... They got railroaded by the oil companies. There was, only, like, hey, there was only one that sort of participated. It was like Husky hi. or something like that. And the rest Some, of them just... like four gas stations. Yeah. The rest of them were, forget it. Yeah. If we don't have to give you this, we're not giving it to you, which is... Kind of creepy. Like, I don't know, if you have nothing to hide, then just turn over the information so the Utilities Commission can go, oh, this is why it's different. This makes sense. Well, and that's, a th I mean, okay, normally you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to give away all my competitive whatever if you're a business person. Yeah, but, uh, but on the other hand, they're, these are oil companies that are every, you know, presumably Esso knows exactly what Shell is doing and, yeah. and they know exactly what Petrocan's doing and they all know what each other's doing. Well, the Esso is owned talking. by Chevron. So They're all talking to each other about what the other is doing. We know that from litigation where there's been too much talking amongst them that it's amounted to price Do fixing. We? Do we know that from litigation? Yes. The price fixing scandal on gas in Quebec. Oh. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> I did not know that you're, 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 you're clearly not a Quebecer. No. You never lived there. No. Um, I have. That's why I have it down. But the, um, in either event, it's probably racist and something we shouldn't do. Um, the, I didn't know that there was a, I know there's been scandals, but I never knew that they. Yeah. They had know. a gas price fixing thing. Okay. Well, yeah. we all, we all expect that that's what's going on. I mean. And every time it's been investigated by the competition bureau, they've never been able to find anything, but maybe once in Quebec. It's kind of like, how is it not price fixing when you look at a corner that has three gas stations? from three different companies and all the prices are the same. That's not, doesn't mean that they decided to do it. They 
could be that they l saw the one person raise their price and they thought, you know what, we're going to raise the price too. I don't want to have a flood of people here and I want to make a little bit more money. Oh yeah. I don't want more customers because the more people that come in to fill up their tanks, the more people that also pop in for a Slurpee, which is just profit. There are ads running right now on CKNW saying, you know, uh, you've probably been using the same gas station for a long time. Why don't you think about trying our gas station? I think it's Husky or something like that. Really? Mohawk, yeah. Um, and uh, I think they have a point. You know, they they are trying to get those clients who are devoted to that one gas station they've been going to for forever. Uh, and so when it comes down to that price fixing thing, it's just an issue of, you know, uh, Chevron is looking at the shell across the street and they're thinking to themselves, you know, we want our regular Chevron customers to keep coming back to Chevron. We don't want them to think about maybe going over there to Shell and getting better gas. Because I'll me, tell you, the gas at Shell, as a regular customer, is the best. This podcast is sponsored by Shell Canada Corporation. No, it's not, but it could be. <laughs> Shell, we will take your money. <laughs> if you want to sponsor the podcast, Shell, I'll say good things about you every mm -hmm. time. I mean, $100,000 will do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'd do it for slightly less. Yeah, 50. Yeah. The, uh, oh, my, my podcast integrity has a low value. Yeah. The, um, no, I used to, I used to buy a Petrocan in Edmonton and, uh, the, uh, my fuel pump in my Volvo, um, froze up and I started using shell gas. I used it forever. I never had to use any, uh, fuel injection cleaner and my shell gas worked better. But actually I don't want to And before that I used shell gas in my MGB, always worked better. Okay. But more importantly, I think for a lot of people in the lower mainland, because of the scarcity now of gas stations, particularly people in Vancouver proper. A lot of Chevrons closed down and Chevron sold that land because the land was worth so much money. Well, I know, but all, uh, my decision about where I buy gas is 100% based on convenience. If I am running out of gas uh, while I'm driving on my way to or from court... I'm going to the gas station that's either on the way to court or on the way back from court. And other than that, I'm going to the gas station that's like a block and a half from my house. And I don't, like, there are times when I will drive by the other gas stations and the price might be cheaper, but it's not convenient for me to stop, so I don't go there. No, but if you go on Sunday night to some of the gas stations the on the... Chevron on Kingsway right next to the Dairy oh. Queen... It's oh. always got a line Sunday night. They drop their gas price to like nothing. The Shell way up on West 10th and um, up in uh, in Point Grey. Um, there used to be a lineup when I lived up there all the time. People would line up to save three cents. They'd be in luxury cars and this to is, save three cents a liter. This is the thing. You know, you look, you're like, oh, wow, it's three cents cheaper at this gas station. I could line up. Or I could go home and like literally at the end of the day, it's going to be a price difference of like, Maybe six dollars. A dollar eighty half the time. Yeah. Because your tank's not empty anyway. Exactly. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're just lined up there well, <laughs> by gas on a Sunday night. Conveniently, my tank is empty. That's the other thing. I don't gas up until my tank is pretty much on empty, because time. I know. But sometimes I come to the office and I think I could get someone to go fill my car for me while I work, but I don't. But I think about it. But you could. But I don't. We'd allow it. I know you would, but I don't. Um, I'd go fill your car for you if I had the time. It's I never have the time, and right now I'm so stiff and I can barely move, so. Well, don't fill my car for me then. I just I filled made, it earlier this I week. made Darren fill my car for me because I literally couldn't get out of my car. Anyway, so the <laughs> Fuel Price Transparency Act passed into law, so now we might finally get to the bottom of why we pay more here than anywhere else. It's punishment for living in Vancouver. Yeah. We have to pay. Yeah, but is, is it like this hidden luxury tax? I don't think so. I think it's actually companies deliberately gouging people. And that's fine. I don't feel bad for the people who are pulling up to the gas station in their Hummers and other expensive cars. But I do feel bad for the people that are pulling up to the gas station in the 92 Toyota Corolla that's held together at the bumper with duct tape. Well, there's a lot of people just fighting to get by and gas is really expensive. And you're, you know, if you are driving the minivan and uh, have to get your kids to school and then, you know, drive to work, 
and then on the weekends drive them to hockey practice and drive them to everything. Yep. Uh, and it's tough enough just to get by in the lower mainland. You're, you know, the amount of money we spend on housing is ridiculous. Um, no, I'm sympathetic. So, and I, you know, I appreciate the fact that the government is doing something. At least it's telling the oil companies that they're going to be, they're going to be watched. Noteworthy is that gas prices in the lower mainland are the lowest they've been probably in a couple of years. It's almost like. It's almost like they're terrified. They're terrified because they saw the bill being tabled. And then they're like, shit, we'd better cover our tracks. Gas price, if you, uh, oil prices drop around the world and gas prices never dropped. So, they dropped you know. like 20 cents, like 20 cents a liter. I know. I filled up the other day for 128.9. I know. I thought I was getting a bargain. Then I got depressed. It was like 38 cents a liter when I started driving See, in 1984. See, depression setting in. Okay. Completely unrelated, no smooth transition between these topics today, Paul. I wanted to talk to you about Linda O'Leary. Oh, okay. So new information has come out from the warrant documents in the O'Leary boating crash case. And I know this is driving law, but this is driving law for two reasons. Reason number one. So she's involved in this boating accident. The other boat doesn't have lights on, smash, somebody dies. I don't know. Um, She leaves, goes home. Somebody at some point hands her a vodka drink, which she drinks. She doesn't know how much vodka's in it or who gave it to her. She drinks it. Then the police show up at her door, knock, knock, knock. So you killed someone with a boat, Miss O'Leary. Can we have a breath sample? And she blows a warning. So what does she get? Not a criminal charge. Thank goodness she shouldn't get one. Nope. But a three-day, not a three-day, sorry, the equivalent of a three-day, the warning-related driving prohibition. Riddle me that. I hate that phrase. But I understand what you're saying, and that is that it makes absolutely no sense sense. because the legislation for the uh, provincial legislation that permits the three-day driving prohibition applies to vehicles on a roadway, at least in B.C., uh, it doesn't apply to boats, and, and there's got to be. Can't legislate boats with driving. Law. And it's got to be relatively contemporaneous with the time of driving, and it can't be on the basis of alcohol consumed after operating the yeah, vehicle. So you get a driving prohibition because of something you did <clears throat> in a boat, to which Ontario's Highway Traffic Act doesn't apply. I don't know. I haven't looked at the Highway Traffic Act to see if it does or whatever. I mean, I'm almost tempted to see if Brian Greenspan wants to come on the podcast and explain this to me. Well, maybe she disputed it and what? We don't know. Maybe she did. We don't know. Or maybe she just thought three days. Whatever. A couple days off the road doesn't affect me. She's just limo drivers driving her around anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so that, that was one thing that irked me about the situation. But then the second thing is this post driving consumption. Because this, of course, was one of the big changes brought in by Jody Wilson-Raybould in Bill C-46 was this prohibition on consuming alcohol after you've operated a conveyance, which includes a boat. And a pool noodle. And a pool noodle. Um, it, It prohibits you from consuming alcohol to get over 80. Now, she blew a warning, so she didn't blow over 80. But potentially... Depending how long after. I'm surprised they didn't arrest her, detain her, and, and make her blow into an approved instrument and then use Jody Wilson-Raybould's retrograde extrapolation well, formula. That's the thing. You can, you can extra- back extrapolate and just add it up to make it 80. Well, all they have to do is wait long enough until she's got a low enough reading that they can back extrapolate as as it up. they get it, get 20 or more. Yeah. yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that's interesting. She's lucky she's not charged because they, there is a mechanism. Where well, she's they, charged under the Shipping Act. Yeah, she's charged under the Shipping Act with careless boating. But she's lucky she's not charged with being over 80 milligrams of alcohol, or at or over 80, two hours after ceasing to operate a conveyance. Because not only could they, theoretically, under the law, not only can they back extrapolate, and they could use the time, maybe depending on when the reading was taken, to say... She was over 80 at the time that she operated the boat. 
and then she would have to raise her intervening consumption and she wouldn't succeed because she was in a boating accident that killed somebody. So obviously the reasonable expectation not to provide a breast sample couldn't exist. Um, the next thing that they could theoretically do, there's no prohibition on this in the code. They could call an expert to say, based on her consumption rate, the vodka that she consumed in the intervening period, based on rates of absorption, you know, up to 90 minutes in bolus drinking situations and usually 20 to 30 minutes after the end of consumption, based on her weight, she would get to 80, or at some point was at or over 80 within those two hours, even based on a reading taken earlier in time. If they know the drinking pattern, which it appears she disclosed to them. But it may not have been disclosed to them in a manner in which it's admissible. Maybe not, but theoretically possible. And that's which the, is freaky. That's the ridiculous it's absurd. aspect of it. Anyway, thank goodness she's not going to be the test case because I feel sorry for anybody who is going to be the test case. And I'm actually somewhat sympathetic to her here. Um, look at the look at the national news coverage. Uh, nobody believes that she was the actual I was operator. Say, of that are you boat. on the on the Kevin drove the boat bandwagon? The dress is uh, what color is the dress? Blue, the blue, blue dress. And, blue and black or blue or gold? Yeah. yeah. Um, White and gold. Yeah. The uh, the dress was blue clearly, and uh, she was. Um, I have no idea. I have no idea. I won't speculate about it. And the reason I won't speculate about it is because I don't think it's fair. Um, and, um, as I say, I, you know, you have to accept the evidence that's there sometimes. And a the evidence of, that's there is two people saying that she was the one operating the boat. A lot of people are very not sympathetic to her. I know you say you're sympathetic to her, but a lot of people are not. They're not sympathetic because here you have somebody with literally no end to the resources they have, like billionaires, right? Billionaires? Yes. And they well, can hire the most expensive Top-notch lawyer. They never Canada. phoned you. I'm not the most expensive, Paul. No, you're the most top-notch, but you know. <laughs> uh, no, they didn't phone me. It's fine. It's fine, Kevin and Linda O'Leary. You don't need to call me. You can call Brian Greenspan. I'm just saying. I probably know this area just as well. It's fine. Um, I don't need your money. <laughs> would have done it for half the price. Yeah, half the price. I would have done it for like... Two-thirds of the price? What they spend on lunch. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, surprisingly cheap. Too cheap for the O'Leary's. Uh, anyway, no, they didn't call me. That's fine. I don't want the case. I'm busy enough. Um, no, but they, they have all these resources. They can hire one of the most expensive, well-recognized, famous lawyers in Canada in criminal law, Brian Greenspan. Nothing wrong with him. Excellent lawyer. But, you know... Well, the average she Johnny does, Lunch Bucket doesn't have that. She does the thing that the law was changed to prohibit for the purposes of people who are well-heeled enough to get that information quickly. You know, everyone was concerned. You know, the cop who drank after mm. the accident. Monty. You know, I'm, I just think when you have all of these resources, it's easy to phone the person who will say... Pour yourself a drink and make sure everyone knows you had it because that's going to be your best defense. Yeah, well, you might not say that though now. Well, I wouldn't say that because that would be advising someone to commit a criminal well, offense. That's the point. But. I don't think that's the, the issue. I think the issue, you, you were touching on the issue, which is they have all the resources in the world. And part of the reason we ended up with the IRP scheme, my understanding is that the provincial government was looking at it and saying, you know, if you've got $6,000 to hire uh, um, Sutherland or Hewson or me or, you know, one of those other people who did this job back before the IRP scheme came in, uh, your likelihood of uh, not being convicted is extremely high. And if you're a person who didn't have that money, your likelihood of conviction um you know, the, the, it was likely that you would end up convicted. 
So, so let's make it more likely that everybody will end up punished. Well, that was basically their thinking was, and the other thing is they thought instead of paying $6,000 to a lawyer, they want $6,000 paid to the government. So instead of taking $6,000 from everybody, you know, the lawyers, the few lawyers who were really good at it, collecting the Dudley Edwards and us, uh, so forth, collecting this money, um, the government was going to collect the money and, and basically force the lawyers out. And it did force a bunch of lawyers out and, you know, me and a few other guys were the last people standing. Well, a number of them became judges. Yeah. Dudley Edwards. Did not. He died. That's another way out. Exactly. (laughs) It's not the recommended path. Are you kidding? It's maybe the, (laughs) maybe the, maybe the best way to go. Some, some who became judges might, might have been thinking, damn it, (laughs) wrong path. Yeah. That's what I would think if I was a judge. Not for me. I would never be a judge. No. Um, no, I... If I failed in all other aspects of life, then I would consider but becoming a judge. <laughs> one of the other reasons the IRP scheme came in was intense lobbying by the family of a very young child who was But that was killed, just timely. Killed by an alleged drunk driver who did not have the big, expensive That was, a, yeah, she was on legal aid. Lawyer. She, she was had on legal aid. legal aid. She had a good lawyer. She, had a she was in legal yeah, aid, but she didn't have a... But she didn't have... She didn't have somebody who does just impaired driving, like that group I listed. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have uh, a toxicologist. And she didn't... Yeah, because legal aid didn't approve her getting a toxicologist. Exactly. Which is BS in a case like that. I know. Um, and this is, you know, the, unfortunately, again, coming back to that lack of sympathy thing. It's hard to feel sympathetic and it's easy to feel skeptical of Linda O'Leary in those circumstances because... She's got all the money. She's got all the resources. She's got all the fancy people on speed dial, I'm sure. Like, I'm sure if you're an O'Leary, you party with the top top big money lawyers like Greenspan. I don't know. What, do they party? I, I don't, don't know. know. I assume that, like, fancy do? lawyers go hang out at parties with rich they, they, people. They go, to din- <laughs> they go to dinners, probably, where they're served, like, lousy food and big yeah. dinners. and. And drink lots of wine. Yeah. And they have time to do that. Well, and then they get in limos and go home. Yeah. And they get a ride. And we've, they don't... Gone, we've gone to some of those things from time to time. They're always so weird and awkward. And I always feel kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. I and guess because you don't go that lot. often. Do you? And I never sweat. Oh. But at those things, I find myself sweating. Oh. It's weird, weird factoid yeah. about it. Well, me. you know, I usually end up talking to a house plant. Um, you drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, why you're talking to the plant. I don't drink too much always. I drink too joke. much at the East End bar dinner. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a long tradition of that. I know. It's the only time I do. Every year I volunteer to be, volunteer to be your, your designated driver. And every year you find yourself a different way home. Like after you've been drinking. And I'm like, what? But I've been waiting here for you. You could leave I earlier. I'd always, I always figure out some way home. doesn't matter how drunk I am. Anyway. The point... Find of, a safe way home. The The point is, I don't know, I guess it's hard for me even to check my skepticism about that. Well, there you go. See, I have checked my skepticism. I'm approaching this more fairly than you. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why Linda O'Leary didn't hire me. Well, Linda like... O'Leary should have hired me. But she hired Brian. She's, you know... I'm sure he'll do a good job. I'm sure he will do a wonderful job for her. And she'll have her trial sooner than 2021. That's true. <laughs> Your schedule is probably probably busier than anyone else. Yeah. So take that, Brian Greenspan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's sitting here listening to the podcast going, oh, I wish my yeah. schedule was as busy as Kyla Lee. You're right. He's not listening to this Lawyer on podcast. the West Coast. Um, well, here no. I am in the center of the universe. Now I feel very inadequate. Thank you. Inadequate. You're, the again, the busiest lawyer there is. Speaking of things that are happening on the East Coast, what the heck is happening in Quebec? Is that the East Coast, really? It rhymes. It's East-ish. It's all the East to me. After so, Manitoba, uh, it's kind of a mess, and I don't know which is which. I um, I gave a, a um, presentation this week, and that was hard to do after my accident, let me tell you, especially with my faulty brain. Uh, I really struggled through it. But um, as I was laying in the dark on Sunday, I was thinking to myself, uh, You know, we really opened up the door when IRPs came in BC um, years ago, over two decades ago now, that uh, they allowed 
the provinces to do quite a bit of legislating in the realm of over 08 and impaired driving. And before that, we had an over 08 in the Motor Vehicle Act that everybody thought was unconstitutional. And now, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but the provinces now have a real, like, inconsistent application of the law. So for a while, for a long time here in BC, if you're convicted of, of uh, impaired driving or over 08, you were paying a higher fine than you were in other parts of the country. You got a longer driving prohibition, uh, despite the fact that it's federal criminal law because it was written into the Motor Vehicle Act. Um, and in Quebec, they've had for a long time, apparently, harsher punishment for refusals. Um, I think they had a two-year driving prohibition the first time out and a $2,000 fine. We now have a $2,000 fine across the country. Uh, but now Thanks Quebec, a lot, Quebec. I know. It was, it's ridiculous. Like it's just, that, that punishment is so over the top. That punishment is so fucking over the top. It's just ridiculous. Like for an ASD refusal where you've got a police officer operating some little handheld device that's not recording any information. It's ridiculous. It's shameful. It's shameful. Um, I'm so disappointed with this federal government for that. But, but it's anyway. okay. You can get time to pay. Yeah. Uh, but the point is now, what do we have in Quebec? Your second conviction for a drinking driving offense leads to a lifetime interlock requirement. So about $2,500 a year in renting the interlock equipment and paying for monitoring equipment. And that's the price right now. 10 years from now, it'll be $3,500. That's $30,000 a rest decade. It also means you can never, for the rest of your life, operate any vehicle that can't have an interlock. Heavy machinery, equipment, it prohibits you from so many different types of jobs. Riding, riding mower? Those big, those big delivery trucks, like the, the big rigs and shit, you can't put an interlock in those. Motorcycle? Yep. Riding mower? Yep. Rental car? Yep. Um, rental truck to move? It is, it, it is like a, a, a form of punishment that is so inconceivably debilitating that it, it defies logic that this can possibly be a justifiable administrative penalty under a licensing scheme. I agree with you 100%, but how is it going to get struck down? Somebody's going to have to challenge it. How are they going to structure that? Well, you would have to, I mean, speaking from experience here in British Columbia, trying to challenge mandatory things in BC's Motor Vehicle Act. First, you'd have to be convicted for your second time. Then you'd have to get notice that you were now subject to the interlock requirement. You'd have to wait until you finished your driving prohibition, which is probably at least three years for a subsequent conviction, just like it is in BC. It's actually, I think, three-year minimum now under the code. I think it's two in, uh, I think it's two in the code. Two. Okay. Well, whatever. You're at least two a couple years. Two years that you're prohibited from driving, yeah. And then you go to renew your license and they say, okay, now you're subject to this restriction. Then you have to write to them and you have to say, I object to this restriction. I wish to review this restriction being put on me. And then you have to wait for the government to write back and go, uh, there's no ability not to do this or it's mandatory. There's nothing we're going to do or, or deny your request for review. And then you have to seek judicial review and constitutionally challenge it that way. Well, they could never reply to you and then you'd have no reply. And, and then, then you have to go and make an application to court for them to mandamus. mandamus order for them to consider it. And then they'd consider it or they would say, we're going to consider it in three years or something like that. And then yeah. you'd end up with a mandamus order for that and you can end up to make it sooner. And then you get a decision eventually. And then you'd have to judicially review the decision on what basis. Yeah. On what basis. That they don't have the authority to do what the legislation says that they do. And we have Court of Appeal authority here in British Columbia from a case that the Court of Appeal overturned of mine that still frustrates me to this day, where they said, well, this is great. The chamber's judge ruled that the superintendent had to do this thing in this case that you've spent years working this, this series of judicial reviews towards. But there's actually no authority to do that 
And so the order the chamber's judge made wasn't lawful, even though all of the case law said that that's how you do this. So you can't force an administrative tribunal to do something the statute doesn't give them the power to do by getting a court order. So, like, the the only avenue is a constitutional challenge. And then what do you classify it as? Punishment? Is it punishment? Are you challenging it under Section 12? Is it a search because you have to blow into the interlock every time and share the data with the government of Quebec? Is it a form of of detention? Is it Section 9? Like, where is your constitutional challenge coming from? Also, for Quebec lawyers, there's three cool ideas for challenging this provision. Those were the best Eight, three. Eight, nine, and twelve. <laughs> best three you could come up with. Um, you're not going to be able to argue that it's discrimination against the drunks. Um, <laughs> Why although, is being an alcoholic not a protected class? <laughs> well, it's a medical issue. Um, but the, uh, you and know. then what about for medical people, people who have mm. medical issues, but they can't blow. What if something happens to you in your, in the course of your life between, you know, you've had the interlock for seven years and then you get lung cancer. Now you just can't drive. You've lost one lung. You've had one lung removed. Yeah. Can't drive anymore. Like, Not allowed. Cause you can't blow into that interlock and hum at the same time. Yeah. What's going on in Quebec is absurd. I mean, I have enough trouble with the indefinite lifetime driving ban that you get for a third impaired driving conviction in BC, but at least there is a provision in the Motor Vehicle Act that allows it to be reviewed by the provincial court. You can apply to your sentencing court to have it reviewed. So there's like a quick and easy way after you've served a portion. Well, there is a there is a, a method in Quebec after your second conviction after ten years you can apply after for a ten review. Ten years. Yeah, and but on your third it is there's no there's no application to apply, so you're See? done. Um, but how the, can you have a power <clears throat> over somebody's life for the rest of their life that is unreviewable? Like, is it not? unconstitutional, contrary to Section 52, I believe, of the Constitution, to create unreviewable government powers? Do, I don't, do, I don't do know. the courts always have inherent jurisdiction to review the exercises of discretion made by government in uh, applying legislation? If I didn't have a head injury, I might be able to answer <laughs> your question, but it's it just basically sounded, that was so beyond me at this point, I... Okay. I can't answer. Great guest you've got tonight, Kyla. Yes, well, that's you've okay. Got... It's just me ranting and you being my sounding board, which is, you know, not that different than normal. Maybe I'm a better guest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else you wanted to add to on that? the podcast? To that topic? To that topic or to any driving law topic. I don't know. Maybe I thought you'd bring... Bring something along today? No, I didn't really have anything to bring along. I'm sorry. I, I really want to talk about the Sense BC video yeah and i really think that you should probably have somebody from sense bc on probably chris thompson for the purpose of that because i intend to but i should tell our listeners that tonight's podcast was not supposed to be recorded the way it was uh i was supposed to be traveling out of town for court and uh that got canceled for reasons unknown to me it happens and uh so I was a little disorganized because I thought I was going to have to do sort of an on-the-fly, on-the-road podcast. I couldn't line up guests or anything because I thought I wouldn't be around. And so you planned on using me as your your semi-functional podcast, Ed McMahon. Well, Who you, was semi-functional most of the time. I believe in the past you have said that you would always be my semi-functional podcast guest. Anyway, I did I want... I will tell you one thing about ICBC this week. Uh, we have a um, a uh, smart car that we use to drive from our Vancouver office to our Richmond office and to do the odd delivery. And we bought that smart car because it was economical. Um, doesn't use much fuel. It was good for the environment and they're safe cars, uh, generally speaking. Um, and we've enjoyed having it. And when we went to renew the insurance for our our um, uh, person who does most of the legal assistant who does most of the driving in it, um, despite the fact that uh, she is a class five driver and despite the fact that she's been driving several years and has never had a collision. And that she drives that car around every day. Well, she doesn't drive it around. But she's just three days a week, really, because we have enough other people who are driving back and forth that we don't right. need to. 
uh, do it every day. So three days a week she drove the car, not a lot of kilometers on it. But the, uh, and she's in the same uh, years of driving as the previous person who was driving it. And we went to renew it uh, with her as the principal operator. And um, it was uh, about $1,600, $1,800 more. It was $3,600 for a smart car without collision insurance on it. And the smart car is worth $3,600. That's the value of the smart car, yeah. It's, you know, they, 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 it's with those kilometers on it and the options and stuff and the new tires, it might be $4,500, but whatever. The point is, it's like the insurance jumped by that much in a car that poses so little of a risk as opposed to that Porsche Panamera that <laughs> rear ended With the me. end driver. With the end driver rear ending But me. that driver can afford the, you know, $7,500 insurance bill that I'm sure they're getting. Yeah. So we're not going to keep our smart car. We've already um, decided to move on and um, and uh, going to manage somehow uh, another way. Probably we'll just drive the uh, Acumen Law Corporation uh, F-150. <laughs> All right. Well, that is our podcast this week, everybody. If you need to reach us, uh, give us a call at uh, 604-685-8889 or find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com and tune in next week to find out whether Paul is recovered and able to adequately articulate constitutional law like normal. <laughs>